All right, Melanie, thank you for being on. And uh, like I said before, before we got on, it's been a long time coming. So again, thanks for showing up. Appreciate it. Yeah. No, thanks for your patience with me too. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about radically open security and like, what's the, I want to understand this because I feel like I don't have a good grasp on this. So maybe a good place to start is kind of your background in this or what is it and in, in getting a good background, um, how you've got involved in this. Right. So um, Radically Open Security is a social enterprise in the cybersecurity space. Um, I'm also a cybersecurity professional. Uh, you know, I've been uh, in uh, cybersecurity since, gosh, uh, I would say 20 years, 21 years <laughs> by now. And um, yeah, I started the company just uh, quite simply because I was discontented with uh, some of the other alternatives on the market just because uh some of the market leaders in the netherlands tended to do things like work with intelligence agencies hack activists uh build surveillance boxes and then sell them to developing countries and then when the, the hackers community asked them to stop doing that did they stop no they just like sold that part of the company uh so um, you know, I, I had some philosophical differences with that. And I just thought, you know what, uh, I think that uh, I can do this better. <laughs> so, um, you know, also my own uh, route through uh, cybersecurity. I mean, I also uh, started as an academic. I used to be a uh, assistant professor of computer science at the Free University of, uh, of Amsterdam. Um, you know, and I did uh, research on RFID security for about, um, yeah, I guess seven, eight years. And then uh, I left the university, went to uh, Citrix and worked uh, on the Zen hypervisor for a little while. And then I moved over to ING Bank and worked on their cybercrime team for a while. And that was when I sort of left and uh, started Radically Open Security. All right. To probably several people in our audience, it's going to sound like a foreign language, <laughs> what you just said there a little bit. Uh, so I think it's good to dive in what is it about cybersecurity that we, maybe just as delay person, just don't understand about it? And then on the other hand with that, why is it so important that we invest into this? So um, I think that cybersecurity is a fundamental human right. I mean, because if you consider how much our uh, lives are going online these days, um, I mean, certainly since the pandemic, um, you know, so much of our data is uh, everywhere, really. I mean, on our devices, in uh, other people's clouds, <laughs> really, you know, spread all over the internet. So uh, in that sense, um, I think that um, we need to make sure that uh, companies also are, are taking care of our, um, the security and privacy also of our data. Um, you know, so basically, uh, the reason why I also with with radically open security that I wanted to make it a social enterprise in the cybersecurity space is because um, a lot of these commercial companies, you know, they are sort of treating uh, our security like it's a cash cow, right? <laughs> uh, and um, what they're doing is uh, they are. Um, you know, acting opaque, not really wanting to share their knowledge uh, with the customers that hire them in. But it's completely counterproductive because, I mean, some people would just say, oh, but like, who cares if you're ripping off a bank, you know, with <laughs> overly expensive and, and low quality services. But the truth is that, you know, if a bank has security issues, like one guess who winds up suffering, you know, it's it's the customers, it's people like you and me, you know, I mean, as soon as there's some men in the browser, <laughs> you know, malware uh, that's going around or some fake apps or whatever it happens to be. I mean, you know, we're the ones who are going to wind up with empty bank accounts. So I don't think that it's OK, you know, for commercial industry even to rip off, you know, commercial customers, because ultimately the uh, the stakeholders of all of this are, are, are normal people like us. You know, and that's uh, why, you know, I decided to create create radically open security with a very different business model. Um, I, you know, we're nine years old now, but at the very beginning, I, I basically sold radically open security for one euro to a foundation. Uh, so basically, I gave the company away. Uh, and I also registered us with this kind of archaic uh, tax construction 
uh, called a fiscal fundraising institution, which is this odd construction from the Dutch church. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, sometimes a church wants to do a commercial spinoff and then they uh, that money that they raise goes back to the uh, church again with a tax benefit. And a famous example of this in, in the Netherlands is the Language Institute, Regi Regina Chaley, otherwise known as the Nuns of Fucht. Anyway, the nuns started this really great language institute. The profits go back to the nuns. But the point is that I made it so that like our so-called commercial spinoff was a cybersecurity company. And our you know, so-called church was uh, the NLNet Foundation, which is an internet-related charity that funds open source digital rights and everything for a better internet. So um, basically, this whole FFI construction forces us to donate 90% of our profits to charity. 90. <laughs> so, you know, and that's basically giving uh, all of our non-reinvested profits uh, to charity. Uh, the last 10% is also our cash flow buffer that we need uh, to actually make payroll at the end of every month. All right. That's a very different way of doing things, clearly. Uh, it makes me wonder, though, you mentioned about the monetary aspect and almost that the monetary part has become the larger end game for these companies. How do you persuade or maybe not even persuade? How do you get out a message that um, the money is not the most important thing? The integrity of what we're doing, the rights of people is more important. How do you get that message out either to help these companies change or just to create a different model in general for people doing this? Well, I mean, that's sort of what I'm doing already by uh, creating a non-commercial company that occupies the commercial market. Uh, because it forces those commercial incumbents to compete with me. <laughs> uh, and that's not necessarily easy to do because ethics has market value. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, and uh, in, you know, in nine years time, I mean, we have grown to a company of roughly uh, 50 people. We've had hundreds of customers, you know, from uh, Google to the European Commission, to the Dutch energy grid, to banks, telco hosting providers, uh, core internet, uh, but also, you know, SME startups and also nonprofits, NGOs and civil society. And we work for the latter at cost price on a zero margin basis. So, you know, we've been really quite successful. And the point is that because we're there on the commercial market, uh, the other yeah, competitors, I would say, they, they have to reckon with us <laughs> being there. And uh, just our, our sheer presence uh, on the market and also just offering uh, customers this kind of an alternative really has made the customers more choosy, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, because if they can get, you know, very good quality cybersecurity services for roughly the same price and they know all the profits are getting donated to charity, you know, plus we also have an open and transparent workflow that we call peek over our shoulder. Uh, which is basically when customers sit in the, the chat room together with us and actually watch us and observe us and interact with us while we're busy breaking their stuff, <laughs> which is also, of course, really entertaining. Um, you know, and, and also it's good value for money because we're transferring the hacker mindset. So, I mean, so for all of these reasons together, it makes us a really attractive value proposition. I mean, for our customers, but also just for, for hiring. Because, <laughs> I mean, ethical hackers also tend to be super idealistic. And, you know, would you want to work for a company like ours, you know, for, for pretty decent money, you know, and do a certain job? Or would you rather work for one of the big four accountancy firms, you know, uh, for maybe equal money, but just not knowing that actually the whole thing is just a line, you know, shareholder yeah. stock. I mean... The choice is easy, actually, and it's made us made it far easier for us to hire staff and high quality staff as well. And then the high quality staff uh, drives customers, and the whole thing has really been just a nice positive reinforcing cycle. So, would you say say well in terms of ethical hacking? I haven't heard that term before, but uh, it's very interesting. Would you say that you said you have a lot of high quality people? Is it more that people are attracted to the ethics of it? Um. That you believe people are more attracted to the ethics of things versus maybe they just haven't had the option to have ethical <laughs> options in the past as well. Um, do you think people want to be good with this type of industry or, or is it just that out there it's like, oh, people are just hacking and taking people's information? Is there a large group of people that want to have ethical hacking and believe that this is actually a better way of doing things primarily because – that you see someone out there that's actually offering it. Sometimes you don't even know 
what you can do if someone is not actually offering it, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, the opposite of the opposite of ethical hacking is being a cyber criminal, you know, and not everybody wants to live a life of crime, right? You know, I mean, I, sure, you can earn really good money doing that, but do you really want to live your entire life, look, you know, looking over your shoulder? So, you know, in that sense, I mean, the entire cybersecurity industry is filled with what I would call ethical hackers, uh, you know, and, and 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 even, you know, all the commercial companies, I mean, you know, they're they're still ethical because they're hacking on the side of the good guys, <laughs> you know, I mean, because the whole job of an ethical hacker is basically to hack a customer that that has given us permission to be there. In fact, they've even paid us to be there the majority of, of the time. And we tell them how we did it and we give them tips to fix it. And of course, we don't abuse them. We don't exploit them. And the whole purpose is just to find holes and vulnerabilities so they can patch them before, hack, you know, hackers with uh, less charitable motivations uh, show up, you know, and we just gradually help them to sort of pick up the low hanging fruit and to find the, the most obvious things uh, so they can keep raising the bar uh, with their security. I mean, that's the whole, you know, job of, of what ethical hackers or so-called penetration testers. Uh, hmm. Interesting. How do you see this? How, how do you see ethical hacking in the age of increased AI? innovation things such as like chat gpt and just the incredible onslaught of new ai development how does that work together right um i think uh, ai is good at doing things that a lot of people have done before in the same kinds of ways i mean you know it has uh, processed a incredibly large data sets and it's really good at uh, spitting out frequently used uh, patterns for things um probably it's not as good you know at uh, coming up with things that uh, haven't been done uh, quite so much um just because that's not going to be present in its data set you know that it's using for training in the first place um look i mean ai is good for some things and it's not really useful for other things. I mean, I would not say in the short term that it's going to completely replace human creativity uh, or or to that extent, even just, you know, craft. <laughs> um, because uh, the thing is, like, with 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 ethical hacking, I mean, it's it's sort of like art, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, it's sort of part art and it's part science, but um, yeah, it's just, there are a lot of products uh, with AI, you know, for example, monitoring systems, intrusion de detection uh, and, and intrusion prevention systems, um, you know, also adaptive like firewalls and things. I mean, you know, th there's a lot of solutions out there that make use of AI, but the problem is it's it's really only as good as the training set and it mis misses a lot of things. It can also mis mislabel things as well. I mean, we, you wind up getting a lot of false positives and mostly false negatives, uh, you know, and in, in looking for, uh, for activity. Look, it's not to say that you can't use chat GPT for some rote, routine, boring things. <laughs> and of course, I mean, the hacker community right now is looking at generative AI to see if it can speed up some of the most brain dead, <laughs> you know, of the work uh, that needs to be done. Uh, certainly there's some amount, I think, of really basic code auditing uh, that probably a, a chat GPT could do. But the only thing is, I mean, you also need to consider the, the governance situation. I mean, um, you know, because the whole thing with AI is uh, it's only as good as the person steering it, right? Because, uh, you know, prompt engineering <laughs> is uh, sort of becoming the, uh, you know, the next science, <laughs> you know, and it's not that per se is just replacing jobs, but it's just that the jobs are evolving, <laughs> um, you know, in the direction of this prompt engineering, which basically means that a really good hacker could undoubtedly use chat GPT as yet another tool. I mean, it's basically yet another form of scanning tool, <laughs> uh, you know, to find vulnerabilities. Um, but it's only as good as the person that's steering it, <laughs> first of all. Yeah. And, uh, and the second thing is that even if a really good person is steering it, the problem is that if you were to use something that's hosted by uh, OpenAI, for example, 
uh, or some other third party commercial service, uh, you're basically giving them information about people's vulnerabilities. And uh, giving third parties access to zero days is not a very smart idea. Because, uh, of course, this can be widely abused uh, for all kinds of ends. Um, and, and anyway, the the end game for this stuff should be, you know, responsibly disclosing these vulnerabilities to the vendors to ensure that uh, these things can get fixed. And I'm certainly not going to be handing over um, <laughs> the vulnerabilities that we find uh, to third parties anytime soon. As a rule, we don't use uh, cloud-hosted um, you know, services of any kind uh, in our pen testing process, just because, you know, there's a t-shirt that says there is no cloud, there's only other people's computers. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, everything- That's good. Do, yeah. <laughs> you know, so everything we do is is self-hosted, preferably with open source uh, software, um, you know, because the governance uh, of the vulnerabilities of our customers matter and, and their confidentiality matters, uh, you know, and also people's privacy matters. So, you know, in that sense, you know, and there are GPT uh, versions that uh, that are open source that also can be locally hosted. You've got things now like uh, Llama uh, and Alpaca, uh, you know, also which are GPL, uh, I believe, uh, versions of this stuff. Uh, but part of the problem with that is, A, I believe that it has a uh, non-commercial license and even though radically open security is a is a kind of a foundation owned social enterprise, we're still commercial enough that we don't fall within the uh, the license and usage terms. But the other problem, though, is even if we did, um, the problem is this uh, GPT is only going to be as good as the data that you train it with. <laughs> and of course, uh, part of the reason why OpenAI, which started out as a foundation, went commercial was because you know the of you know they got the you know, uh, the, the, the billions, you know, for Microsoft, uh, so they could basically, um, you know, be able to hire all that processing time, uh, to be able to, to, <laughs> to, 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 to grind through, you know, that, that massively, <laughs> you know, just uh, unimaginably large data set. Um, and, you know, we don't have the resources to do that. Certainly. I also have no desire to, um, uh, you know, and right. on top of, even if we did that then also opens other, issues, you know, of, uh, again, other people's data governance and intellectual property and GDPR. I mean, we're also located in Europe. So, I mean, if people want their data removed from that initial set, they need to be able to request it and have that happen. So, I mean, it, there's just so many cans of worms that, I mean, I think chat GPT is a very difficult thing. I think that, yes, it will be useful for some things, but we also have to keep in mind that AI has it's it's old. It's been around since the '80s. There's been many hype cycles, and you know, and then also cycles where it was just like you know AI is dead. You know, and it kind of goes like from like hype, ooh AI, AI is dead, ooh AI. I mean, it's just been like this, you know, for the last well, like 30 yeah. years uh, at least. So we just need to like keep things into perspective. What we're seeing now is a bubble. <laughs> Uh, with AI at the moment. Uh, I mean, yes, it's it's definitely exciting technology, but I mean, it's not any different than it was also for the last 10 years with the earlier GPT versions that, you know, the researchers were working on. And on top of that, you know, neural networks and, and deep learning, this stuff is, is much older. You know, I mean, people are like, oh, we have this AI now. Well, we've had this AI all along. I mean, Google's been using it and Facebook yeah. and Amazon have been using it. So we need to keep things into perspective. So, I mean, yes, it's it's interesting and it's exciting. And yes, it's it's a tool and we need to explore it and also figure out where the limitations are. But let's also just not get out of hand too much with the hype because i mean a lot of it is also just investors getting really interested and in, in thinking they might have found the next uh you know unicorn bubbles and uh you know that's a whole nother thing entirely so yeah the the term hype cycle that's interesting and about that because i think you know humans are always trying to predict the future mostly wrong <laughs> in many ways and i think this is one of the kind of predictive future things is like oh ai is on the cusp and this and that, but the reality is we just don't, we don't know. We're pretty far away from what we believe that type of future, whatever, however fantastic that may be is, is not as close as we think it is uh, all the time for that. But I wonder how do you relay this to kind of the average user of the internet and talking about their data for that? Cause people are just using the internet 
and providing the information at incredible clips without really thinking about it, honestly. So how do you make this a relevant conversation to most people who are just typing away, searching away, giving away all of the information? Yeah. I mean, look, I mean, the future could be great or the future could be crap. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. It all really depends on the business models of the, the companies that are utilizing this stuff. I mean, I've spent a good portion of my career as a cybersecurity professional, and particularly when I was an academic, building privacy-enhancing technologies to protect us from Google, from Facebook, from Amazon, you know? And it was really pretty frustrating because, you know, I was building these technology band-aids to, to, to try and fix business model problems. At a certain point, I became of the conviction that we actually need business models to fight business models. But with AI, just like with so many other technologies, it, it's a dual use technology. You know, it can be used for good things. It can also be used for uh, just profit maximization. And that's creating a lot of the social problems that we have. So, you know, in that sense, uh, you know, I, you know, I've heard talks also from Ray Kurzweil, you know, also about the singularity and he's talking about how we're going to hook our brains to the cloud and, you know, I'd rather not. <laughs> I think that's pretty far away. I know people keep think, thinking with Neuralink and all this stuff, but I can't imagine that's anytime soon. I'm sure that a lot of people would debate me on that, but it seems like it'd be much more complicated and intricate than just, you know, putting something in your brain and then, oh, it can turn off and on. I, I just think it, it can't be that, you know, well, this soon. Human, human brain interfaces have already been a topic of research for right. at, least 20, at least 20 years. Right. <laughs> I mean, just with, with electrodes. So, I mean, again, we're, we're, we're treating this all like it's something completely new, but a lot <laughs> of this is just sort of newer, you know, revisions of, of, right. of older technology. And again, it's just these hype cycles and, you know, I and I I would not want <laughs> my brain to be controlled in any fashion, you know, by somebody's cloud. And I can tell you exactly why. It's because I'm a computer hacker. <laughs> <laughs> the moment you hook your brain up to the up to up to the cloud, I'm gonna hack your brain. <laughs> right. You know, I mean that's pretty I, scary to think about, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and on top of that, I mean, you know, you, you're you, you'd be letting these these commercial companies, you know, who, whose sole intention is is profit maximization by law, you know, to their shareholders. I mean, they I mean, why would you trust them? I mean, it's just right. I mean, and, and look, I'm, I don't mean to sound like a Luddite. I mean, I embrace most certainly, you know, the, the the newest technologies. But at the same time, I also accept that there's a certain risk utility calculation that all of us are making, you know, and there there's no right or wrong. I mean, it will fall in different places for different people. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you know, just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean that we should, <laughs> you know, and, but, but ultimately it's up to people, people and their autonomy, you know, to decide yeah. how far they want to go with these things. You know, I mean, you also have these self-proclaimed cyborgs that have been implanting RFID chips in their body also for, for 20 years. I mean, you know, good, you know, good good for them i mean you know <laughs> <laughs> it was a, it was a real hype for a while yeah you know? yeah i remember that actually yeah i know you know and and now i think probably some of them probably would feel a bit silly and i can imagine some of them have had the chips removed by now yeah especially yeah. given the fact that there's little to no security on the on, on the majority of those chips especially the implantables to begin with so uh i don't know like 20 20 years ago or actually back in 2000 and six i guess 15 years ago i wrote a paper called uh, is your cat infected with a computer virus uh, that was literally about <laughs> uh, putting malware on those kinds of uh, chips uh, that you would inject into yeah. animals like cats or, or or potentially humans so anyway but look the sky hasn't fallen with these things i mean you know ultimately we will find a balance because i mean even with cyber criminals it's not in their best interest most most of the time to completely destroy everything. I mean, they want the ecosystem to continue thriving enough because if it doesn't, it's going to destroy their business model. Right. So, you know, so at the end of the day, we all just sort of find, you know, kind of an uneasy <laughs> balance. I mean, it's the same thing with the tech companies too. There's only so far that they can go in their profit maximization before they also have a riot on their hands where they start getting uh, beaten down by the regulators uh, or, or governments. So in that sense, um, 
yeah, I mean, it is what it is. And it's, uh, yeah. you know, it's a bit of good, it's a bit of bad, but let's also be a bit down to earth with, with the whole hype thing because, uh, you know, we're constantly reinventing things and uh, there's, it's some good, it's some bad, but at the end of the day, most of the time, the sky doesn't fall. So Yeah. Well, what, what would most people be surprised to know about um, their kind of, what is being maybe surveilled or observed about their cyber activity that would be surprising like what would be like wow i'm doing this activity online and i didn't know that this is what's happening behind the firewall or what are people watching or how can this so easily be my information be taken but does anyone find this surprising since edward snowden you know made yeah. his uh, revelations <laughs> i mean you know it's it's completely common knowledge now i think that uh you know certainly that the u.s government is in uh you know, in the databases of all of these tech companies. So, yeah. but look, I mean, it's a question of how much people care. <laughs> and mean, that was I what I was going to say. I was like, well, how much? Because I don't see a lot of people like throwing up their arms about it and like, oh, protect my data. Give me, you know, pay me a percentage of the data that's taken. I mean, in my observation, I haven't seen that, but I'm curious what you think about and extending that is how much do people actually care? Most people don't. I mean, right. you know, and, and to be honest, I mean, most people, you know, some, some people have more reasons to care than others. I mean, the U S government, you know, is not necessarily in the threat model of most people. I mean, if you're some kind of a dissident or if you're worried about some hostile government uh, that might be uh, getting uh, data from one of these big tech companies and, and this happens, you know, then I think you, you have a very different threat model. <laughs> and then I think you need to be a lot more uh, cautious. Uh, about the data that's being collected. Um, but at the same time, for the majority of people, they're just like, yeah, whatever. I mean, you know, who cares? I'm completely uninteresting. You know, l let them see my stuff. Um, th there are, of course, two problems with this. I mean, when you know, most of the time when people say I have nothing to hide, uh, my usual response is sure, you know, you have nothing to hide until the marketers start calling. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so um yeah, and uh, and beyond that, I mean, we're we're also assuming that data breaches aren't going to happen. And even if uh, a company is perfectly trustworthy, that's not to say that uh, they couldn't get some kind of a malware infection, you know, leading to a data breach, and then having your personal data wind up on the dark web somewhere, you know. I mean, and and that's the thing with with creating data about yourself. I mean, you really need to think about, uh, you know, is it okay if that, you know picture that I just took of myself, you know, that maybe my grandma's going to see it, <laughs> you know, and, and we can assume that the company maybe themselves won't be the ones to release it. But if a hacker does, what are you going to do? You yeah. know, and the only recourse that you really have for those kinds of things is to, to be conscious and, and not make that the kind of media in the first place that you wouldn't want your grandma seeing or your employer. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of people struggle with that, Melanie. <laughs> I think it's no. such a, <laughs> you know, hair trigger society. It's like, you know, whether you're, I mean, I was just traveling this past couple of days and I mean, people are literally taking pictures and uploading things at incredible pace, like no matter where they're at. I mean, there, I've seen people take pictures in the bathroom and like the airport. And I'm like, why? I'm like, I mean, this is a terrible place to be taking a picture, you know, but this is what we're doing. We're doing all types of weird things all the time, you know? But look, I mean, I use some amount of, of social media too, you know, and the truth is, I mean, I'm certainly more aware of most people, you know, uh, what the, what the threats are and what the costs are. But at the same time, yeah. you know, if I have a small group on Facebook that happens to be family and childhood friends, and it's the easiest way to uh, stay in touch with them and I'll lose touch with them, you know, <laughs> if I, if I'm not using Facebook and, and, you know, that for me, again, it, it comes down to a utility versus risk or cost analysis, yeah. you know, same thing with LinkedIn. I mean, I have a, a, a considerable LinkedIn presence. I'm probably connected to, I don't know, last time I checked almost 6,000 people. Yeah. So, you know, in that sense, I mean, I, I use it because it's a really powerful, you know, platform to be able to broadcast to people. And, you know, it's really useful for some things like hiring, but I'm just putting work stuff there. I mean, yeah. and I'm setting it to public anyway, and it, it's only my work stuff. So if people are like, oh, look, Melanie had another presentation. Oh, gee, look, she was now on <laughs> podcast i mean whatever yeah, that's right. 
all that's all public anyway. So yeah. I mean, for me, I mean, yeah, yes, I realize that is all being mined and 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 you know and yeah. and uh, I'm being yeah we're all being manipulated, but um, mostly I ignore my news feed anyway. So it's just. Uh, <laughs> But we all have to make our own uh, decisions for this, you know, and some people are sort of more um, hardcore, <laughs> you know, and are more likely to really issue, you know, some of these big tech companies. And again, it's not right or wrong, but it's just individual decision. Yeah, I mean, that's a good thing for in life in general. It's a, a lot of individual decisions. I think what comes down is when those individual decisions, this is a broader picture thing affect other people negatively. Like you said, somebody is seeing something that they're like, oh, I don't want to be in that picture or I don't want to have this video while I'm doing this. I think sometimes as people, we struggle with the the fallout from things like that. We think it's innocent, but we don't necessarily think, well, I'm going to do this and I'm going to think, did that person care if I did that? That was also in this. I think we struggle with that quite a bit too, though. Yeah, yeah, indeed. You know, so it's an interesting, it's a slippery slope. It's an interesting thing, but it does come down to, you know, make, I was going to say, you know, people really looking at the pros and cons. I'm not even sure that happens a lot of times. <laughs> I think it's just shoot and go, man. You know? Yeah. I mean, but that's human. I mean, I, I don't yeah, of course. I do before I do it either. I mean, we're all humans. Yeah, most definitely. So I wanted to follow back um, to a thing I was saying before is, so what are some things like people are not necessarily thinking, like how can they say, hey, have a conversation on cybersecurity and they go, okay, this is relatable to me. What are some things I should be looking out for that could, if I want to be someone who's more, who's into like, hey, I don't want everything out there. What are some basic steps or precautions that people could take or right, not in the cloud stuff, apparently here <laughs> so? Yeah. Um, look, I mean, if people want to use clouds, use the clouds, but again, it's just, a, you have to do that cost benefit analysis of whether or yeah. not it's right for you and just make conscious decisions. You have to be mindful of what you create of the media that you create and just, you know, be careful where you're pointing your cell phone and, and consider using <laughs> yeah. covers, <laughs> you know, be smart. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, and also just with what you're writing down, just try not to write things down that you wouldn't want, uh, the rest of the world to see, um, you know, because that stuff uh, can, you know, leak out and, and that might have consequences. I mean, also financially speaking, um, you know, there's also risks and benefits also to uh, to different kinds of online uh, payment uh, that you can do. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, I also use online, you know, banking and things like that. I mean, just because it's uh, extremely convenient, but uh, but you do have to be aware that there's organizational uh, safety measures that might be behind it. Things like, for example, with credit cards, I mean, they're extremely sensitive to fraud. <laughs> yeah. um, but there is, though, uh, a uh, procedure that if you notice that somebody did fraud, <laughs> you know, you can basically contact the customer service department yeah. and get the fraudulent charge uh, removed uh, from your uh you know, from the, from the, the, um, uh, from your balance. And, yep. and that sort of is, is what makes the usage of credit cards acceptable. It's not perfectly safe, but at the end of the day, nothing is perfectly safe. I mean, getting out of bed in the morning and, and getting off our couch and getting out the door is not safe, you know, but we do it anyways, because if we yep. don't, we're not, we're not living. So, <laughs> you know, and, and this is, I think, uh, what we need to consider. But, you know, beyond that, though, there certainly are. Oh, hello. Um, <laughs> My cat's here, too. So it's kind of a cat party. <laughs> like, Yeah. So uh, so but the point is, I mean, there's uh, certain precautions you can do for sure. Um, you know, I mean, certainly software updates is uh, the number one thing. Yeah. Uh, you can do um so ne never delay that never postpone that just because the number of uh you know um vulnerabilities <laughs> <laughs> that's a beautiful cat by the way i mean really beautiful like thanks that what an so awesome i like i get pets on here all the time it's all good <laughs> like <laughs> Suddenly the quality of this podcast went up. <laughs> oh no, it's all good. Yeah, I'm you know, I just roll with the punches, man. I just think that's that's life, right? There's a risk in everything, and things. People go, Oh man, I'm so sorry this happened during the podcast. I'm like, why? I'm like, it's just part of the experience, you know. It's all good. Okay. You're a human being, you have pets, I have pets, you have different things <laughs> yeah, I saw going on. But uh, you know, our time anyway, is about but, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, but uh, but but yeah, but there are simple precautions that you can take. I mean, definitely using uh, strong passwords, mm -hmm. uh, you know, is 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 a best practice. Also, trying not to reuse them uh, for people who are kind of bad about this kind of thing. I mean, certainly there's password managers uh, yeah. that are out there. So, uh, I mean, sadly, occasionally there's uh, breaches with these password yeah. managers. So, I mean, that's yeah. also not perfect either. I mean, they're also a uh, um, a single point of failure also because, uh, uh, but uh, actually one of my favorite uh, sort of tips uh, and techniques for uh, passwords is um, either magic links, uh, which I think are really okay. great, or uh, just the, the forget, I, you know, I forgot my password link, which is essentially yeah. the same thing. Because yeah. let's say I go to a website and I buy some concert tickets and it's basically a website that I don't actually care too much about. <laughs> you yeah. know? I mean, what I can actually do is just go to the website with my browser and then I can, um, you can basically have your browser suggest a new password and yep. then, uh, you know, it'll basically automatically create a strong password for you. And then it, yeah. it it will ask, do you want to remember this password? Right. Uh, I'll just say no. <laughs> yeah. So basically at this point, I'm now logged into this uh, website. I have absolutely no idea what the password is, but it doesn't actually really matter. I'll just buy my concert tickets. And then when I'm done, I'll That's log right. out. And then uh, at this point, uh, there's a password with my email that I have no idea what it is. But the next time I want to log in, I'll just go to the website and hit, I forgot my password. Yeah, that's right. I'm just going to send a, a password reset link to my email, which is the same thing as these magic links. And it, and it's far better because, I, you know, and in some ways I really prefer it uh, to um, password managers because of the password manager uh if somebody uh compromises the master password then they have your entire collection of passwords right. because if you if you just don't even save it in, in the first place that's a good I mean, point hackers can also steal them out of your cache uh, off of your devices as well yeah so and if you don't know what it is then it can't be stolen so uh yeah, yeah the yeah. spirit of data minimization that's one of my favorites that's awesome i mean that's that was a very helpful tip well we're coming down to last minute here please tell everyone how they can connect with you melanie and and what you're up to? Yeah, for sure. So uh, you can connect with me uh, on LinkedIn. Um, I respond if you message me most of the time. I'm friendly. Uh, also, uh, if you want to know more about uh, my uh, cybersecurity company, it's radicallyopensecurity.com. Uh, and I also uh, have some crazy business model stuff. And you can also find that at uh, nonprofit.adventures. Perfect. Thank you so much for your time, Melanie. I appreciate you. And thanks again for inviting me here.